Join us as we dive into the history, hauntings, and high strangers of the world to try to better understand the paranormal. I will be your guide. I am paranormal researcher and investigator Eric Freeman Sims. Welcome to the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Unseen Paranormal. This week we are chatting with paranormal researcher and author Ana Maria Manalo. She is the author of Portal, A Lifetime of Paranormal Experiences, The Way Through the Woods, and her upcoming book and our topic today, Haunted Heirlooms. Ana has traveled the world throughout her life collecting stories of the supernatural and unexplained from over 27 countries, including accounts from her hometown of San Juan in the Philippines. Ana Maria Manalo's books are available on Amazon, Kindle, wherever fine books are sold. Hey Ana, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks so much. I'm fascinated with the paranormal in general. I mean, that's why I do what I do, but uh, being an investigator and doing the podcast here, but uh, haunted objects have definitely always intrigued me. And I've kind of always been on the fence about if I really believe an object can be haunted, but there's so many stories out there. So how did you get into writing about the haunted objects? Well, it, that has a very interesting history. It actually began way, way back in my salad days when I used to collect antiques or I, I don't want to say they're actually antiques. I think at the time, because I was still in college, you know, being on a very limited budget, I would go through flea markets, thrift shops, you know, things of that nature. And I, I want to preface that, you know, during that time, you know, things were pretty, I guess, open, you know, uh, you know, there was a lot of people who were selling different kinds of things in all different kinds of stores. And I found myself really just interested in a lot of things that I guess people eventually come to bring into their home because of the way the object is crafted. Uh, you know, it could be fine china. It could be a piece of furniture. And the way it all began was I was in college uh, with only about maybe a 30-minute drive uh, or a, a train direct to New York. I was in the company of a bunch of people who were also college students like myself. Uh, on the weekends, we would try and escape and hop on the train, the Metro North to New York. And in the process, we would go through Greenwich Village. We'd go through all different kinds of shops. And I would always pause at an antique store. So, Eric, if you recall back then, things were cheaper. But even antiques back then were not cheap. They were always, you know, a lot pricier for obvious reasons. Yeah. So one day while I was in school, a friend of mine came over and at the time, there were some of us that had access to cars and some of us that didn't. This one friend that I had actually had a car. It was a vintage Beetle. And so everybody kind of like wanted to befriend him so that they could travel with him in his car. So it just so happened he was headed out to a flea market. Uh, and this one is actually in New England. So I joined the group, found myself in this huge open market. And I guess in California, they call them a swap meet. But it's basically, you know, kind of like a place where you could find things that were used or in, in some cases, you would find things that appeared antique. And that's where my story begins. I actually stumbled on a wing chair. And it was a beautiful to me at the time, a beautiful piece of furniture. There was nothing wrong with it. I sat on the chair. Uh, you know, I looked at the way it was stitched together because it was covered in some kind of fabric and it, just the design of it really captivated me. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to, to afford a piece of furniture. And when I asked this man, it was pretty nondescript. He was just sitting there kind of like a statue. I was amazed because he told me it was only $36. So I bought <laughs> this piece of furniture, knowing I had a ride home uh, to be able to get that in the back seat somehow. 
And that's exactly what we did. So went back to school. I was in a dorm that was kind of like more set apart from the other dorms on campus. Uh, Dave, who was the friend that had the car, helped me put the wing chair in a corner of my room in the dorm. And Eric, that's where all kinds of strange things began. (laughs) And I, you know, I'm not the kind of person that expects things to be haunted, even though I was raised myself in a haunted house. Yeah. Which is another story altogether and which is covered partly in my first book. I wasn't expecting in a pretty modern setting to have to deal with anything of that type. So a few days into having possession of this beautiful piece of furniture, which I sat right underneath a window, the only window in the room, uh, a lot of people started having experiences. One of them was a dorm mate who lived down the hall uh, and actually uh, saw a woman coming out of my room. Wow. And we had a strict visitor policy because it was an all-girls dorm. Uh, and the other wing, incidentally, which you will find funny, uh, nuns lived there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for for obvious reasons, they did not want visitors uh, because things were supposed to be very quiet. It was supposed to be a very studious dorm. Partying was discouraged. And it went on from that. And then years later, I I still collect antiques. And to this day, I'll tell you, it never discouraged me despite the experience that we had. Anyone who reads this book, they will find out what eventually happened to the people around that chair and to me. And it's probably the one and only time I ever sat through a seance involving an Ouija board. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty crazy. Because uh, do you feel like you were drawn to the chair, or did you just like it because of its aesthetics and and it was an antique? Well, the thing about it, I think, was number one, the fabric, the design of the fabric. It was flowery. It it looked expensive, and then I was taken aback by how cheap it was. And part of me was grappling with, do you really want this? It's a real bargain. And so I think the bargain hunter in me was the one that got drawn to the chair. Yeah. And the other thing is, it wasn't like in some musty, dark and dreary room that I found this chair in. Although I have entered a lot of antique stores that are like that. It it didn't really come with any kind of a vibe. You know, in retrospect, Eric, I I never really sensed anything negative from it or that something was attached to it. You know, I touched this chair, examined it, sat on it. My friend Dave sat on it. You know, we were checking to see if it was sturdy and in one piece. Never really detected anything out of the order. But then again, you got to remember, this was sitting out in the sunlight at a flea market. Yeah, and I wonder if the guy was selling it so cheap because he knew there was something attached to it. And, and and see, that is, I think, part of the issue with these things. It's kind of like, um, you know, when people buy a home and it's actually much lower than the surrounding homes. Yeah. And they think they have a bargain in their hands. I think, you know, you have to think, buyer beware. There's a reason why. There was nothing wrong with this chair. You know, and then there's some articles of furniture that are out there. There's nothing wrong with them. Uh, there is one in later on in the book that's a bookcase. It had a little blemish, and the woman said, that's fine. It, you know, sometimes it happens. It happens when you're trying to transport something. Um, this one was in perfect condition. I couldn't see anything wrong with it. Of course, at that time, I really couldn't tell an antique from a fake. So it wasn't like, here I am, you know, 18 years old, looking underneath the chair to make sure it was signed or dated or numbered, all those, you know, things that people do these days. I didn't at the time, but there was no vibe in particular. But I will tell you this, when I brought it into the room, something in me told me that when I turned around, you know, there was a scene there in the book where I'm making hot chocolate 
and I'm sensing someone is watching me. <laughs> and I don't know if it was just my imagination. It, it's these dorm rooms are single dorm rooms, so there's only one person that lives. You know, it, it seems like as the night progressed, when that chair was in the room, I just had that feeling of someone watching me. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting because uh, you know you go out and buy stuff like that, and you, you don't. That's probably the furthest thing from your mind that you know there there are a lot of people out there that collect antiques or or just go to flea markets and, and buy stuff because they like something and without the thought of well maybe I'm bringing a you know a spirit into my home or attachment or something yeah and, and you know you you walk in just basically expecting to get something authentic right and once you purchase it and the deal is sealed, everything, you know, the certificate is handed to you, that pretty much ends the story. You're ready to enjoy it. With with the dealers I dealt with over the years, uh, and the ones in particular that are part of the book, and and I have to preface and say, you know, thank you to them for sharing their story because a lot of these people, two of them are still in business. Yeah, They've handed it down to their children. Uh, Two, of course, have retired if readers read this book, they'll realize why they retired. I probably would have retired much sooner than they did. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it got started. Yeah. And, and like watching, you know, stuff like Antiques Roadshow, which is hugely popular in the United States. And, and you don't think about that side of the business. And so that's kind of, that's kind of awesome that these dealers, these antique dealers were willing to come forward with their stories and share them with you that they've had these odd occurrences and these haunted objects. I'd have to say the most difficult part of putting this book together, aside from getting the details, you know, scheduling all the different conversations, the interviews, is actually reassuring them that I would not share where the store is located or was located or who they were. Yeah. Which is very understandable because a lot of them have reputations to uphold. Uh, in one of those cases, they almost lost the business because word got around. And the one I'm talking about, there's five stories in the book, including mine. One is about a lithograph. It stands out in my mind because this gentleman was the most challenging person to interview. He, in the process of revealing to me what happened to him and his family, uh, and the friendship that he had and how the business was starting to unravel, I could detect that it produced a lot of anxiety, so much so that, you know, he started to question his own ability at, you know, seeing what's really true or not. So I, I try to reveal as much of that in the book without revealing exactly where he's located, who he is, or the name of the business. But I think that was the hardest part about writing this book. Actually writing it when all the information was in was, for me, very enjoyable, I hate to say. But it it also, you know, made me think. You really have to think about, you know, what you have in your house when you bring something in or when you walk into a home that has a history. It's not necessarily going to be a positive history. So there's always a risk of something lingering in there, something that still wants to possess either the house or the object, literally and figuratively. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, In my curiosity, like I could understand, you know, somebody living in a house and, and loving the house and wanting to stay there. I'm not a real like tangible person. I don't for me myself, I don't put like a lot of emotion or stock into objects. And so, uh, uh-huh. so I find it interesting that people, that these people would, you know, pass away and they love this object so much that they would follow it around or, or haunt somebody who has it in their home, you know, at that point or business or whatever. And, and, you know, Eric, I, I agree because I don't either. I think what's different about these owners, and this is just conjecture on my part, is that when, these people looked into the history of who might have owned it before them. There's one story that comes to mind without giving away all of the details, of course, is that the person's life was tragically cut 
this woman who lives in Massachusetts and still lives there to this day, they had a very successful antique store. And because they traveled a lot looking for antiques all over the world, they happened upon one which she personally loved. And she, I don't know if you're familiar with blue and white ginger jars, vases, urns, things of that nature. They're usually porcelain and there's usually like a very elaborate design. And sometimes it's Chinese. You could see Chinese symbols on them. They refer to them as blue and white ginger jars for the most part, but they could also be huge faces. They could be three feet tall, as large as three feet tall. But they're beautiful, and when you put them together as a collection, they're very striking when you place them in a home. Now, some of the audience might be more familiar with that. It's usually seen in someone's living room. And when people collect these, they put them together in one side of the living room or sometimes near the patio so that the sunlight comes in and you could see how beautiful they are. The woman in this story decided she wanted one to add to her own personal collection on top of the fact that they had an antique store. This is one that she decided it was an urn that she would bring into her home. So. You know, people shop, and when something comes finally to the house, people get very excited. You know, there's kind of a sense of like, let's unwrap it, uh, let's take a look at it now that it's here, kind of a thing. And I, I'm sure that women relate to this really well. You know, even like a handbag, you know, you unwrap it and then you look at it and then you look at it again. You know, there's kind of like a deliciousness to the entire event, you know, and I I don't know what hobby you have. I mean, some men fish. My ex-husband used to love collecting bamboo fishing rods. And when they came in the mail from Cabela's or whoever they are, it was like something to be looked at and treasured and, you know, tried out when he goes fly fishing. So it's in the same spirit, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So this urn comes and it's all boxed and, you know, it's all wrapped with care. And because it came from Europe, it was insured and, you know, they wanted to make sure it came intact, that it wasn't broken and things of that nature. And it sat there at the front door and the UPS guy brings it in and it's so heavy, he could hardly bring it in. So the woman comes out. And she helps him take it through the threshold, and eventually it ends up somewhere near the blue and white collection, which they call a chinoiserie. Chinoiserie is in, like, you know, Chinese jars and, you know, things that are designed in such a way that they might have Chinese symbols. She goes into the kitchen. She's interrupted by, you know, something that's going on in the household, The housekeeper is over there. There's a huge dog in the family. They're eating well away from the living room, and you have to sit down for this part. Are you seated? (laughs) Yeah, I'm sitting. (laughs) So they're over there, and suddenly they're hearing all this scratching, scratching and scratching, and, and the dog is going crazy. It's a Bernice Mountain dog, you know, the huge, huge animal. Yeah like 110, 120 pounds full grown. The maid rushes out, the housekeeper, and the lady of the house goes back, trying to figure out what's going on. The housekeeper comes around towards the patio, and lo and behold, there's something that's trying to rip open the box that this urn is in, like as if it was trapped. Yeah. Now, we're talking a suburb in Boston in the 20th century. Whatever it was, according to the woman and the housekeeper, it was larger than their dog. Yeah, that's 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 pretty crazy to because they're just going about their normal lives. They got this vase, this nice piece, and now they've got some sort of creature trying to rip through this box. So someone, as as I was relating this story prior to writing the book, I was relating this story to a couple of friends. And of course, you're going to have devil's advocates in the mix. You know, there were a couple of gentlemen 
it was over dinner, a couple of gentlemen in the room, and they said, maybe something came in from the street. And I said, well, the, the problem here is that the patio is actually walled in. It's a walled in garden. You come in through the front door. The front door was closed. This box was right by the French doors. French doors were open to the outside. But the problem is the outside part is a walled in garden. So unless someone actually scales a five foot wall, and jumps down into the garden just to open a box. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, and also in being, you know, the location where they live, the suburb of Boston, there's not going to be any animals that are as big as the dog, a dog that no. big. So. I mean, we're talking about pretty well-populated places. And the part that really stunned them as well is that whatever it was, it disappeared. And the dog came over, and they were there. It was sitting on carpeting. By the time they got to it and whatever it was had left, it left a gaping hole so that you could see part of the urn that was inside. So all the shrink wrap and the bubble wrap and layers and layers of, you know, the box that secured it to make sure it didn't break, all that was littered all over the floor. And then here's another piece that's unexplained, and I I couldn't tell you what that was. No one could. There were these black specks that were left on the carpet, and they looked like they were fine ash. Yeah, that's interesting. Like something busted out of this box and left this trail of this black stuff on the carpet. Yes, and, and they have no idea what that was. And as it went on, I mean, that was not something that deterred them. They were just trying to figure out what broke into the house. They went ahead and unboxed the urn, and then they they left it there, and they noticed that the dog was very uncomfortable. And this is, you know, these kinds of dogs, they're usually pretty quiet. And the dog kept sniffing around, agitated. You know, you could tell there was something yeah. that was going on with this urn. And then it went on into the evening. And you know what happens once the sunlight fails, stranger things start to happen. The couple sleeping on the second floor, the door is closed. The wife is lying on her side facing the door. And suddenly she feels someone standing over the bed. And it seemed like it was the housekeeper. She then gets up. There was no one there. She opens the door to the hallway on the second floor and guess what's in front of her? <laughs> the the urn. The urn. <laughs> right there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm guessing these people never had any kind of paranormal activity before this. Apparently not. And they've been in the business for years. So I the, the one thing I notice is that these events, thank goodness, they, they seem to be rare. And maybe some are unreported. I don't know. It's kind of like UFOs, you know. Some people say, oh, it's such a rare event. You know, maybe you saw something else. Maybe it's this. You know, they toss it up to something else. But then you don't know how many people had just chosen not to say anything. Yeah, because, I mean, there's there's people, lots of people out there who, you know, don't want to admit their house is haunted because of, you know, they're afraid in their community that they'll be ostracized or, or things like that. So, yeah, definitely with the object because with an object being haunted, that's a little more, I think normal people would, would look at that as a little more far out there than your house being haunted. Yeah. Yeah. And the tough part about that is that they, in order to get rid of whatever it is that's infesting it, just like you would with a house, you have to involve someone else, someone that's either, you know, a a clergy or whatever you choose to believe that would remove it right uh has to be involved so there's almost like this secrecy on the other hand in order to bring back the normal in the normal life they had to involve someone and this was one of those situations where the woman of the house was pretty conservative her husband really was very reluctant 
to do anything with it other than because of all the indents in the house since the urn came, he had to physically remove it and bring it to the store. But then he couldn't sell it. There was almost like a reluctance to, you know, why would you hand out or, or put on sale something that you know might have a, a history that would cause havoc? Right. So he stored it, consulted someone else, and tried to find out the background. And in this particular case, they had to resort to alternative means. They did not want their clergy to find out about it because they had a reputation. And you know very well, Massachusetts is pretty conservative. You know, in some cases, especially around the area of Boston. And they had to go to such lengths. And then the daughter came home from college and threw out, you know, an alternative solution. And the mother was appalled. She said, are you serious? You want me to go to this person? And in some cases, you know, because there was nothing else left to do, she had to be open to it. Yeah, because, I mean, this is something unexplainable. So you're going to have to go outside of your normal life you know to figure out uh how to fix this yeah think outside the box as they say so a lot of these people in this volume had to think outside of the box they actually had to get out of their comfort zone and entertain something that they never thought they would go through and and i think that was one of the things that it, it, it sounded like almost like they were meant to encounter these objects, because it forced them to look at a different view of reality that they never thought possible. Yeah. And also, you know, uh, the, the question comes up of, well, if since something was unleashed, apparently out of this box in this urn, even if they got rid of it, would it have got rid of the activity or maybe not? In some cases, I think that by handing it to someone else, it gets rid of it. And there's some in the stories that are like that. Uh, someone who is willing to take it off of them. There's one of the story of a lithograph, which is a, it's hard to explain what it is because I actually saw one and someone was explaining to me how it was done. But it was like a printing process of an actual, it looks like a photograph, but it's in color. And in this particular situation, the lithograph refused to be burned. Wow. I won't go too far into it because it'll spoil the story, but it was something that really questioned the reality of the person who owned it. And in that particular, getting back to your answer, since I tend to get tangential here, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I had asked them, how did you finally get rid of it? You know, because this was like eight years ago when it happened. And he said someone was actually willing to buy it. And it was through a priest that he met this person. So when you think about clergy, who's usually very conservative, that would never venture to talk about these types of things, unless they're exorcists. And there are exorcists out there that are very well aware of these things. This particular priest referred this gentleman I was interviewing, and I used to be a frequent flyer in his antique store. This is how I knew him. He actually referred him to this woman who was an antique collector, an art collector, and the husband was a curator in antiquities. So the guy, of course, followed through on the lead because the priest couldn't help him. Yeah. And the woman met with him and purchased it. And I'll stop right there. <laughs> she knowingly, she knew, you know, the history and was still willing to take the object. Yes. In that particular case, she knew the history. She knew where it came from, for one thing. And then she threw out something there that that antique dealer didn't know anything about, and he was introduced to a totally different world. I don't know if you're familiar with, we would commonly call them genies. Yes, the gin. The gin, the one that comes out of, a, you know, 
what is it called? You know, like I dream of genie. But then there's the gin that's the evil gin. The gin that changes shape, that is amorphous, that actually can play with our minds. So he was introduced to the concept of the jinn. Yeah, and the jinn in the Muslim world are are kind of the they get blamed for a lot in the Muslim world. And that's that's where those they come from is is from Arabic and in that tradition and that's where we get like you were saying, that's where we get genies from in pop culture. Yeah. And the gentleman in question unwittingly was Muslim. He was from Syria. His birth parents both came from Damascus. He was adopted by a family who happened to be natives of Maine. So there he was in the middle of Maine running an antique store. And lo and behold, one day he has dinner with some very close friends, another couple, and they gift him with this wrapped object. He opens it up and it's the lithograph. And that's where his voyage begins. And so kind of like the people with the urn, you could kind of say that maybe he was meant to take this object. Yeah, it it feels that way to me. You know, that when I was talking to them, you know, all these things, these circumstances that were happening. um, I have a college friend that I've kept in touch with through the years. His story is the oldest in the compilation because it goes all the way back to the mid 80s. What's uncanny is he had the encounter with me with that wing chair at my university, at the college I went to, because he was also a student there. But then he started renting a home in a neighboring town. And that the home, <laughs> believe it or not, so lucky he is. It was an old Victorian home. He wanted to rent off campus with two other college friends, and the place was infested. And I don't mean by rats. Yeah. So while this wing chair that I had acquired, we were in the process of trying to figure out what to do with it. He was moving into a Victorian house just about half an hour away that was also infested. And then years later, his parents' antique store in a totally different state encountered this antique that they will never forget. So something is, there's a thread with these people who somehow something is pushing them to understand a different kind of dimension, a different kind of reality, to get them off their normal set of circumstances. That's what it felt to me. Like, you know, a friend of mine used to say to me when I worked at a school, you can't make this stuff up. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) This is just weird. Yeah. And like you're saying, you get all the weird threads and synchronicities of things that just snowball into, into this paranormal stuff. Exactly. And that's what it was. It was like synchronicity. And I had to sit down and say to him, tell me again, why did you move into this? Victor- I didn't pick it. There were people living in it. One had moved out because they'd had enough. And the rent was so, and once again, there you go, Eric, the rent was so cheap. It was a bargain. Yeah. So of course he's a poor student like I was, like everybody was. He moved out, and he moved right into the Victorian house. So it was almost like he went from one situation into another situation, and you got to sit down for this. After he was dealing for a number of years with that situation in that Victorian house, he had to deal with a situation in his parents' antique store. <laughs> <laughs> Triple, uh, what, what do you call that? Yeah, I, I just I, some people I, I've I've had paranormal my entire life. Like you've had paranormal throughout your life, and some of us, it's just that's our lives, you know, whether you want it to be or not. And I guess my question is, what brings that about? What makes us different? Yeah. What makes this guy different? Yeah, I don't know. I've like I said, I've had a paranormal experiences my whole life, and it kind of just chose me. 
Yeah, that's an interesting question to ponder of, of why there are people like us that just the paranormal kind of surrounds more than others. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, people sit and wonder, what is it that we're doing? What is it that we're watching? Because sometimes people say if you're watching a lot of horror movies, and you're reading a lot of scary stuff, these spirits are aware of your fascination with it. And, I, and I, I believe that. I really do. But that was the first and last time I actually dealt with an Ouija board. And it was something that was brought in by someone who wanted to run the seance. Before that, there was no real fascination, per se. It was more, we lived in this house, and these things were happening. I don't know if it was the same for you, Eric, but you know, you don't pick a haunted house to live in. Yeah, for me, it just kind of, my, my parents actually bought this house brand new in 1974. And so, you know, I don't know what the what was on the land before the history of the land, but um, the house was never haunted until I had my first experience at eight. And I've talked about that here on the show. It, it's just, I think I've had other things follow me home since then, but my house continues to be haunted. Like it's a I don't know. I always say I'm a lighthouse in the dark. I'm like a beacon. And it feels that way, doesn't it? It feels like somehow they're drawn. Yeah. There was one recent encounter that I had personally, and this one is in Connecticut, and it was actually in my mother's condo. And I won't forget it because at the time, and this is when I was visiting her, she was recovering from a leg injury, and I had just brought her back from the hospital. I had positioned her in front of the TV set. I started making dinner. She had her feet propped up, and, you know, things were normal, 7 p.m. It was summertime, so the sun just started to kind of dip down. As the evening progressed, I started sensing something heavy, almost like when you dove into water and you, for a minute, forgot you were in water and you start kind of like gasping for breath. Yeah, It's kind of like a very similar feeling that I had. I was also preparing for bed because I was exhausted. I had been in the hospital all morning, you know, prior to making sure that she was being discharged. So I started heading over to the spare bedroom, which was the guest bedroom where I would be sleeping. And as I passed, there was a light switch, there was a washer and dryer, and then there was a thermostat. As soon as I passed the thermostat and was at the threshold of the bedroom, I heard someone said, through my right ear, get out. That's what it said. It was a male voice, get out. So I thought, oh, the TV set, you know, the news must be over or something was over and there was like some kind of series on or some movie. So I turn around. I'm a little perplexed. I head back down this long hallway, come back out into the living room. And she was watching some kind of game show. So I thought, OK. I said, is everything OK? And she said, yeah, why? I said, was there someone here? She said, no, I'm by myself. So I come back down the hallway. Second time around, I finally entered the room. And the temperature in the room, I kid you not, was at least 30 degrees lower. So I come out of the room and I look at the, the thermostat on the wall. And it said 70 degrees. So I turn it up. I push it to about 75 because I knew she would be cold. Came out again did the dishes, went back in, the room was still freezing. To make a long story short, I finally go in, I make the bed, okay? This is just a simple, I think it might have been a queen-size bed. Simple queen-size bed, fairly new. It was a guest room. She had, you know, people coming in, staying overnight, friends, whatever. So then I get ready for bed, I come out, she goes to bed. I close the door. It's now late. It's probably about 11, 1130. And the room is freezing. Check the thermostat. It's still 75. 
I look at all the vents, they're all open, who knows? I finally lie down. As soon as I shut the lights off a few minutes later, there is something that is so sharp that pierces my back. So instinctively, I jump up. Something was in the mattress. Yeah. I pull the covers off. I'm feeling it, feeling it. There's nothing there. And I feel something hovering over me. And I thought, ah, you're just tired. You know, like everybody else would. You're just tired. Get back in the bed, lay down, a couple of seconds. Now there's two things that are pushing me out of the bed. It literally felt like the tip of a knife had been pushed through the mattress and up into my back. So this time, I was almost in pain. There were two of them. I got up and I really felt something in the ceiling was looking down at me. And it got so cold, Eric, I could not stay there. So we're Roman Catholic. I was raised Roman Catholic. I go and rummage through the drawers and I find a crucifix. I find a rosary. I prop the crucifix, turn the lamp on, and I kneel by the bed. I open it again to see if there's anything in the mattress, nothing in there, and I just started saying the rosary. And as I progressed from one decade to the next, you know, it's a string of beads. The room started to get warm. I started hearing the traffic that was outside the window. And then that sense of something above me started to dissipate. I climbed back in bed, pulled the sheets over, and now it's too warm to have a comforter over me. And next thing you know, I woke up, it was morning. I wonder if uh, it's something, you know, somebody followed you home from the hospital or, or what? That's the only thing I can think of. I mean, our family had a tragic history. We had a tragedy when I was two years old. And I always wondered whether whatever that was still remained with us, particularly with my mother. My mother is very reluctant, and I will tell you this, she has not read any of my books because she's very concerned something would materialize yeah. in her own words. So she has not. And, and I said, I, that's fine with me. Whatever makes you feel safer, because it's just too close to home. The uh, infestation that was in my grandparents' house in the Philippines was unprecedented. I had never seen anything like it. And I, I wrote it in detail, and this is probably one of the very few podcasts that I will admit that that house we lived in was so infested that I think we probably would have benefited from an exorcism. Wow. It was an unofficial burial ground where they put the bones of Japanese soldiers, and there were some that were killed in action underneath the house. And no one ever told my grandfather that that neighborhood was a burial ground. Yeah, there's all kinds of, I mean, all kinds of tragedy and, and trauma. I could only imagine what that would bring to that house and that property. And I wrote about that, you know, because World War II is it, just one of those things. I mean, people talk about Ukraine and then things escalating in the Middle East. You don't want another world war. I wrote a book. It's called The Way Through the Woods. And it's about a young girl who had to escape from the Nazis. And she was a German child. You know, her, far, her family had harbored a girl who was disabled, unfortunately, and they were discovered. And when she went into the woods, she will tell you in that book all the experiences that she had, including what her father went through when he was looking for her. It is not a joke. It's pretty bad. And it, and it stays. It stays in the memory of people. It really does. She had nightmares for years. You know, on top of the fact that they were being hunted down, she also had that experience. And this is way out in Germany. Yeah. Right in the middle of the World War. Yeah. And, and like you were saying, you wrote about your experiences in the Philippines in your first book, The Portals, A Lifetime of Paranormal Experiences. Yeah. I think that it was a very cleansing experience to put together, you know, all the things the neighborhood was going through. It's funny because one of the things I would have had liked to happen is to have a reunion with some of my neighbors to talk about, you know, what had transpired and, you know, what other research 
these people had done after they had moved out. The last time I visited there was several years ago, and it didn't even resemble the neighborhood that I lived in. But I also went to the old townhouse that my mother and father had rented way, way back. And now everything is all built up and everything. And they talk about the demonic presence. This presence resided in a huge tree. I'm not really sure what kind of tree it was, but that's where it would materialize, right by a tree that towered over the back of the house. And there was a creek right along there in the back. And they said that once nighttime came, you could sense that there was something back there. And whatever it is, is very evil. Yeah, there are some there are some places in this world that we just can't wrap our heads around. Places like that that we just, you know, we're only glimpsing the, surp- the surface of what's really going on. How did you get rid of that infestation in your house? Or was that something you just left behind? Um, I still, I still have a resident ghost. Um, he doesn't really bother me much. Pretty sure I brought him home from a location, uh, that he followed me home. Oh, great. Yeah. And I've seen him. He's a civil war soldier and, um, I I can tell you exactly what he looks like, but we've learned to cohabitate. (laughs) And so, uh, (laughs) yeah, you leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. And you know, we're, we're good. So also have a, one of my dogs that we had to, put down a few years ago i see him every once in a while and uh so he comes and visits but yeah this this one civil war soldier he's he's still around but like i said he doesn't really bother anything he's not malicious it's not anything evil you know i think uh he followed me home because i see him every once in a while recognize that he's still here wow i love the dog story you know we always wish we could always have our pets with us forever yeah their lives are so short yeah, I've got a I got a friend putting out a book here soon that the story about my dog chases. Uh, she had me write it for her book, and uh, and it's my story about him and the the weird synchronicities around him and him still being around is is going to be in her book. So I'm looking forward to that. Nice, nice. I look forward to reading that. You know, it's interesting. We don't get too many animal stories. Yeah, you know, dogs coming back from beyond the grave. It seems like a rarity, and yet. You know, a lot of people out there are dog lovers. And, um, you know, we put down a dog last year and she was so different. You know, the the personalities are so distinctive. And she was one of them that had a very distinctive personality. Yeah. So I think there should be more books about dogs and, you know, the afterlife. Yeah. And that's that's the book that she's putting together is about animals coming back to visit owners and like, you know, really heartwarming stories, you know, not, not anything like hell hounds or something like that, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but pets coming back to visit. Werewolves. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. and, and it, it, it should be out later on this year. Her name's uh sin, uh, C Y N Schrader Hill. And, uh, she's written quite a few books and I've had her on the show and became friends with her. And I had mentioned my story about my dog that, I, you know, have this weird, because you don't hear a whole lot about, about animals, like you were saying about pets coming back and visiting. And so, when she decided mm-hmm. to write the book, she messaged me and was like, Hey, I need your, I need you to write your story about your dog and I will put it in my, my new book. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. You know? So, uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that upcoming book. Like I said, she, that should be out later on this year. So that's so cool. I love it. So the haunted heirlooms book, it should be out later on this month. We're recording this in the middle of May. So your haunted heirlooms uh, should be out later on this month, and you have the other two books, like I said, "Portals: A Lifetime of Paranormal Experiences" and "The Way Through the Woods." They're available on Amazon and Kindle, and people can find you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and at storyartisan.wordpress.com. And you've started your own podcast. Well, my podcast is called The Sinister Archives, and it's basically a storytelling uh, podcast. So I'm not as industrious as you are, Eric. So I, <laughs> I don't invite people. All I do is I read stories that rivet me. Uh, most of them come out of the books that I have published. Uh, and w- what I do is I talk about different experiences of people um, that I've come across as well in my travels. Um, the most recent book that's coming out, and it's not coming out until after September because I'm still currently writing it. Uh, involves a paranormal investigator, and his investigation is about a mansion 
that was going to turn into an inn and how it refused to be renovated. So I am currently still compiling stories, and I just got permission from this wonderful gentleman uh, who is an active uh, investigator. Uh, he is actually from the Harrisburg area. So, But yes, Haunted Heirlooms is shortly coming out. I actually just got the final proof today, so I'm going to go through that. Uh, and then it should also be on Amazon. Yeah, and congratulations. You just signed uh, another contract with Beyond the Fray, like you said, for another book and then for uh, an additional book uh, next year as well. Yes, yes, I have. All right, Anna, thank you so much for coming on today. I really enjoyed our conversation and, and hearing the stories. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. All right, everybody. Y'all stay safe out there. We'll see you next time. Have a good day. Join us next time for a new episode of The Unseen Paranormal. Until then, head over to the Unseen Paranormal Lounge on Facebook for all the latest updates and discussions about the show. You can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, or at unseenparanormalpodcast.com. And please rate, review, share, and subscribe to help more people discover the show. A big thank you to my friend Chris Lips for the awesome theme music. You can find more of his music on Apple, Amazon, or Spotify. And as always, thank you for listening. Bye.